Hi, Durango Montessori family. I want to talk to you today about something that word on the street is that you care about. And I certainly care about it as well. I want to talk to you about poverty. My name is Wade Griffith. I'm the executive director of the Shanta Foundation. We have our offices in the Smiley Building, so you might see me around when you're dropping off your kids or, or picking them up. And I love seeing your kids there. I've got a nine-year-old and 11-year-old, so it's kind of like being around the house when I see your kids around the building. But today I want to talk to you just for a moment about poverty. I want to ask you a question. Is poverty a given? By that I mean is it something that's a permanent part of the human condition, something we can't get rid of, that we just have to learn to live with. Because the way you answer that question, yes or no, really determines how expansively you can think about our response to poverty. If it's a given, then all we can do is band-aid it, reduce it, you know, try to alleviate it in some way. But if we think that poverty is not a given, that it could be solved, there is a possibility of that, then all kinds of avenues of thought and imagination and creativity are open to think about different ways to address it. When most people think about poverty, they think, well, you know, that's a lack of money. And if people have money, they don't have poverty. But what I would say to you is that not having money is a symptom of poverty. That the causes of poverty are largely in these three areas. One might be drive. Are the people in poverty motivated? Are they engaged and working hard to try to get themselves out of poverty? I've worked in a lot of developing countries, places where poverty is the norm. The people that I've met there work harder than I do. They work from sun up to sundown. They often have three jobs. They have the drive because they have kids. They have grandkids. They don't want to live in poverty. Drive is usually not the issue. Second question, contributing factor, skills. Are there marketable skills that they have that a company or a job or some sort of industry would pay them to do so that they would have money and could get themselves out of poverty? Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. They always have skills, but a lot of times the skills are the ones handed down to them by their grandparents, their parents, maybe being a subsistence farmer. Things that aren't marketable, things that can't generate the income that would get you out of poverty. So this really is a question. But the main factor that I've witnessed is a lack of opportunity. You can have the drive, you can have the skills, but if there are no jobs, no place where you can use those skills to make money, you're still going to be in poverty. So these things contribute to poverty, a lack of money, and lead a lot of people to say that, you know, poverty is a given. And then they respond in some ways that I'm really familiar with, ways that aren't always helpful. They see a need maybe on television, or maybe they're on a trip, and an example might be a lack of clean water. And so they decide they're going to do something about it, which I believe is always a noble, altruistic impulse. And they say, I'm going to go home and get my friends and family together, maybe a civic group or a church group or, or just my network. We're going to raise money and we're going to build this well so that these people have clean water, which is always, always a win. But in doing that and in taking pictures of the clean water and the kids playing and the water gushing out and the good feeling that comes from that, misses the complexity of even a simple problem like this much less the interconnected problems of poverty. I've done these wells in Latin America only to get a call six months, 12 months later saying, hey, the well was great, but the pump went out. We don't have the money. We're in an impoverished area. We can't replace it, so we need more money. Six months later, lightning struck, went down the wires, burned up the pump. We can't afford to replace it, so it just sits there idle unless you send more money. Then we got a call that said the copper wire had been stolen from someone outside the community who knew about the well. They couldn't afford to replace that, so they needed more money. And then we needed a guard to protect the solar panels and the copper, and they couldn't afford the guard. More money. 
Later, the walls of the well started to deteriorate because this was an area that had seismic activity. And, hey, we're going to have to do, build another well a lot more money. I think you can see. You don't have to have an MBA to see this is not a sustainable solution to a water problem, much less poverty. And in fact, what we're creating here isn't a solution to a lack of water. What we're creating here is dependency. We're making people who have talent and skills into beggars who have to come back to us again and again asking for money. This solves nothing and is the typical way that we approach poverty in the world. Let me tell you a different approach. About 15 years ago, Mike and Tricia Carpton, Durango folks, maybe you know them, went to Myanmar in Southeast Asia. And they visited some remote villages, and they noticed in this one particular village that they visited, very remote, that there was no schoolhouse. And similar to people's reactions when people don't have water, their heart was touched. They came home, they raised a lot of money from friends and neighbors and their professional network, and they went back and they built that school. And what a school it was. Success. A few years later, they went back because they wanted to see, well, you know, how is it going with the school? Are the kids learning? Is everything working out the way we thought it would? We know the building is fantastic. Only to find out that things weren't what they thought they would be. Instead of the kids being in school, the kids were in the fields harvesting the crop. Working in the fields because of the economic insecurity of the people. They needed the labor of the children. So, hey, you got this great building, but if the kids aren't there, what happens? They also discovered this. This village did not have a clean water source. And if the kids have chronic dysentery, then they go to school. This village also lacked access to health care. Common problem in impoverished areas. If you have dysentery or any other infection and you don't have access to a doctor and you're sick, are you going to be able to go to school? No, you're not going to be able to go to school. And in fact, in this community also, there was a lack of basic infrastructure. And since monsoon seasons cause rampant flooding in Myanmar, and not everybody lives right in the village because it's a farming community, what if you can't get to school because there's no road or bridge? Hey, and because of this food insecurity reality, let's say it's part of the year where you don't need to be in the fields, but you're food insecure and your stomach is empty? Maybe you go to school, but do you really learn anything? See, poverty is these interconnected issues that contribute to this reality that people have. And we have to have a clear mind about the complexity of it if we're going to be effective in addressing it. So, the Shonda Foundation, your... Uh, kind of building mates in the Smiley Building, we approach this totally differently. We go to one of these villages. We ask them what their goals for the village are, not what we tell them they should be. They know their village, and they're smart and gifted people. What are your goals for your village? And they end up being pretty consistent around health care, family planning, contraception, infrastructure, water, education, and then we asked the whole village to elect what we call a VDT, village development team. Men and women, young and old, people with more, people with less, who we can train to plan and execute development projects like this. So that we're not doing it for them, we're equipping them to do for themselves. We don't lift anyone out of poverty. We give them the tools, the skills, to lift themselves out of poverty. Now, if you've been paying attention, you're also thinking, well, that's a great way, they have the skills, but... If you don't have capital, you don't have an opportunity, really, to use those skills. So the second piece is a novel capital structure that we partner with them to create a community bank. And we ask them to sacrifice. It's quite an ask. When you live below the poverty line, you're risk-averse. But we ask them to take part of what little they have, so they have skin in the game, and to match our money to start, to capitalize a community bank, all right? CB. People that live in these isolated villages, they don't have access to banking. So they borrow from money lenders that are kind of like loan sharks. 
sometimes upwards of 30% APR interest. Then they lose their land because of that. They become sharecroppers and more and more poverty. We say to them, hey, let's set up this bank. And then when you need to borrow money for seeds to plant your crop or to replace your house or to start a business, you can borrow from yourselves. This is your bank, your money. What if it were 3% instead of 30%? Imagine the difference just from savings. And then you're going to pay the principal back with that interest, and you're going to see the bank grow. You recapitalize that interest, and the bank grows and grows and grows. And by the way, the repayment rates are over 99% because everybody in the village knows each other. They hold each other accountable. And at some point you say, wow, man, this thing's growing. Let's take a piece of the interest this year. Part of it we put back in the bank. Let's take a piece of it and build a school. Or let's take a piece of it and build a well. Knowing that because this money is loaned out and paid back with interest every year, that there's going to be money available to sustain the projects. If the pump goes out, no problem. We have income that's coming in consistently from the bank. If we need to build housing for teachers or pay the teachers, no problem, because we're managing this bank so that we can grow it, but also siphon off some of that interest, not principal, to do projects and to sustain projects. I think you can see the difference here. This is a holistic approach to poverty because it equips them to address every aspect of poverty for them to address it. We unleash human potential. We train leaders. We give skills and opportunity so that people can lift themselves out of poverty. This is what I've shared with your students this week. I think it was exciting for them because they learned about a different part of the world They got to talk to someone in Myanmar on the other side of the planet, literally opposite side of the planet. They got to think about international peace, but they also got a different vision that we can impact the world, we can change the world, eradicate poverty, one village, one family, one person at a time. So I hope you'll follow up with them in this conversation and ask them to think about how how they want to impact poverty in our world. It was a privilege to get to talk to your students. And if you see me around the building at Smiley when you're dropping off or picking up, be sure to grab me and say hello. I'd love to meet you. Have a good day.